laid for your faith in his excellent word. And let's stand to sing 408. perceive there was a little bit of chaos tonight. Uh, my printer got a piece of paper jammed in it as I was trying to print out the sermon, and a piece tore off deep inside the machine and I couldn't get it out. I worked for about 20 minutes trying to get that out. And the second item of a little bit of chaos for tonight was my fault. I failed to tell Joanne that we were continuing with our study of Christ in all the scriptures from last week um, because we only got about a third way through the Old Testament and so tonight your bulletin said that the message would be believers baptism but instead it should have been and I failed to tell Joanne I'm sorry that it would be part two of Christ in all the scriptures and I hope we can get through at least another third the problem being of course that um, my notes didn't print out. So the reason I was late, I was sitting there handwriting out all the references so that we would at least have them uh, for our study tonight. And so we're beginning in the book of Job. Of course, I can't give you the review from last week. Uh, I didn't have time to write all of that out. But tonight we want to see the Lord Jesus Christ in the books of Job through Ezekiel, the Lord willing. So turn with me, if you will, over to the book of Job to chapter 1. And we will have to look up all the references. I know that this will make Mrs. Whitbeck happy because she takes uh, notes. And she said last week I went way too fast, jumping between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So uh, we will all be on the same page tonight as we uh, turn to those passages together, which I normally have all printed out uh, so that we can move efficiently through. But tonight we begin over in the book of Job, and we want to see some things taking place in Job that we see our Lord Jesus Christ uh, being a fulfillment in the New Testament. Job chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, 
Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord, and you know the rest of the tests that Job faces. Now take and turn with me, if you will, over to the Gospel of Luke, to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And we see a very surprising thing here that our Lord Jesus Christ says, beginning in verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Our Lord Jesus Christ, praying for Peter, that his faith would not fail, as Satan sought to sift him as wheat. That is what Satan was doing with Job in the first two chapters of the book of Job. And of course, our Lord is the one who had to give the permission for that test. Look also over at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, it says, Wherefore... He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That is Christ interceding on our behalf. And again we find over in Romans chapter 8, another magnificent passage about not only the Holy Spirit in verse 26, as I mentioned this morning, but also our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 34, making intercession for us. Who is he that condemneth? And Satan, of course, is the adversary of the brethren and the one who condemns. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Christ, in all the scriptures, in the book of Job, and there are other places, of course, we come to the next the book of Psalms, and in Psalms, we could spend uh, weeks and weeks and weeks, for there are mes many messianic psalms. But the psalm I'd like for us to turn to tonight is Psalm 22. It's a psalm that deals with past events, whereas some of the others, such as Psalm 2 and Psalm 110, deal with future events concerning the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. But Psalm 22 is a picture for us of the cross. To the chief musician upon Ayelet Shachar, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. 
Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths they, as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. The dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And much more here in this psalm, but we turn now to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 27, where we see this psalm is being quoted in multiple verses concerning our Lord Jesus Christ as he hung on Calvary's cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, is how Psalm 22 begins in verse 1, and so we'll begin with that verse, although there are others that come before it. Psalm chapter 27, and looking down at verse 46, first of all. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's Psalm 1, 22, 1. And then back to verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garment among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Also from Psalm 22. We go down to verse 39. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priest mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Of course, all of that directly out of Psalm 22. Verse 48 and straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed to give him to drink. And the rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. We find our Lord Jesus Christ next portrayed for us in the book of Proverbs. Turn with me, if you will, to Proverbs chapter 8. And of course, there are many places in the book of Proverbs that reflect the character of our Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. But Proverbs chapter 8 is wisdom personified. And some very interesting things are told us beginning in verse 22. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no fountains abounding with waters. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there when he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. 
rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction, and be wise, and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. And of course, we have already seen our Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 1 as the creator, the pre-existent creator, who made the heavens and the earth, and wisdom is here speaking of that. We see that in him is life, and the life was the light of men. And here we have Proverbs speaking to us of, Whoso findeth me, findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. We see wisdom personified and also given to us that Christ himself is that wisdom over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 20 through 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And then we get down to verse 30. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Christ in Proverbs. We find our Lord Jesus Christ also in the book of Ecclesiastes. Turn please with me, if you will, to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And looking at the first three verses, we have the theme of a man who does not know the God of heaven. The key phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes is the phrase, under the sun. And under the sun, everything is vanity. If you never get any higher than simply the celestial bodies that circle this earth, if you don't know the God of heaven, it's vanity. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? That phrase occurs over and over in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 15 and find out the contrast, the answer to that which is vanity. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and down in verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is vain. Verse 17, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who answers the vanity that those who are only under the sun always experience. There are other places in the New Testament as well. Turn to the book of Ephesians, excuse me, Philippians, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16. Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. 
First Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained, back to Proverbs chapter 8, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Redeemed from your vain conversation, your vain manner of life, which is what we find in the book of Ecclesiastes. We move next to the Song of Solomon, and this is a book in which Christ is seen all the way through. It gives to us the picture of the joyful bride and bridegroom. And of course, our Lord Jesus Christ portrays himself as the bridegroom, as he gives in his parables. We'll start and we'll just move to chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Here is an eternal love for the bride that is set forth here. Verses 6 and 7. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly contemned. That's not condemned. Contemned means despised. Christ has an eternal love for us. And it is a love which cannot be bought, as we see here very clearly. You cannot, and we have said this many times at the offerings, you cannot buy God's love. You cannot buy your salvation. We give as believers because it is an act of love, not an act of monetary purchase, whereby somehow we gain eternal life. Turn with me to see that picture of Christ in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 25, in fact, we find this illustration in all three of the synoptic gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ as the heavenly bridegroom, but we'll merely look at the one in Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Christ in the Song of Solomon. We find, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. 
He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison, and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Of course, you recognize that passage as the passage that we have been studying in the book of Acts, where we are told specifically that it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see much that related to the crucifixion in that. But we've read the crucifixion narrative. And so let's turn over to Acts chapter 8 and look at verses 30 through 35. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. That's Isaiah 53 verses 7 and 8. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, Isaiah 53, 7 and 8, and preached unto him Jesus. We find Jeremiah the prophet next is many places in Jeremiah where our Lord is spoken of. But we begin in Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7, and down in verse 11. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. This again is a verse that is quoted in all three of the synoptic gospels. We turn first to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, and down in verse 13. Matthew 21, 13. Starting in verse 12, And Jesus went into the temple of God, and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. He's quoting here from Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 8, and also verse 11, which we read just a moment ago. 
We turn next to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11 and verse 17. Again, we find our Lord involved in this same conflict, but we have a little more information given to us. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And here we have additional information. And would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, and this, of course, is from Jeremiah, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer but ye have made it a den of thieves. Once again, we see our Lord cleansing the temple. By the way, I should mention the fact that our Lord cleansed the temple two times. He cleansed the temple at the beginning of his ministry. He cleansed the temple at the end of his ministry, just prior to his crucifixion. We turn now to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 19. And verse 46. Luke chapter 19 and verse 46. He went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And then one other very interesting passage, a passage that is quoted from Jeremiah, though not found in the book of Jeremiah. It is Matthew chapter 27. Turn with me there, if you will. Matthew chapter 27 and verses 3 through 10. Matthew chapter 27 and verses 3 through 10. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What's that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful for us to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood, Akeldama, unto this day. Verse 9. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, and they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. Christ in Jeremiah. We turn next to the book of Lamentations. Very interesting book. A book where the prophet Jeremiah, of course, is weeping over the city of Jerusalem. Jeremiah, the prophet who would tell the children of Israel to give up, to retain their lives by submitting to the king of Babylon. Jeremiah, who, because of his message, was cast, as you know, into the deep, dry cistern which was full of mud at the bottom. And he sank deep into the mud so that when they finally pulled him out, they had to put clots of cloth under his arms so that they wouldn't jerk the arms out of the sockets as they were pulling him up out of the muck and mire that was in that pit. We're in Lamentations chapter 3. And we find a beautiful piece of praise in the midst of this song of sorrow. Lamentations 3, beginning in verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And you know that wonderful hymn that we sing often, Great is thy faithfulness. Here it comes from the middle 
of another song of sorrow, the book of Lamentations. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. This is the hope of the believer in the midst of the darkest hour. Remember that as we turn now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. The one who is our hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Our hope is in Christ. Paul speaks again of that hope in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2, in verse 16. Now, the, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. In those times of difficulty, in those times of distress, the times that you need your comfort, where do you find your hope? It is in Christ. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Even in the times of darkest distress, such as Jerusalem was facing in the days of Jeremiah the prophet, even when there is great destruction and devastation coming to the nation, there is a bright ray of hope in the Lord himself. And for us, we know that one to whom Jeremiah was referring is our Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 1, excuse me, First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. A verse that I think most of you probably know very well. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Jeremiah was ready to give a reason for the hope that was in him. The times were distressing. He wept for his nation. He saw the sins of the leaders as well as of the people. And yet he knew that the God of Israel had given promises that would not be broken and that in him there was hope. And here we find each of the New Testament writers speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our hope. Ezekiel is next, and we turn to Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9 and verses 4 through 6. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh, and that cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said, in mine hearing, so to one angel he gives a specific command, and then to the rest he says, Go ye after him through the city, and smite, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maid and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Turn now to the book of Revelation where we see this being fulfilled as our Lord, the sovereign God of the universe, sends judgment 
upon the earth. But he marks out certain ones with his own seal that they would not be touched. Revelation chapter 7 and verses 2 through 4. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, saying, unto the, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. There are two marks in the forehead in the book of Revelation. One is the seal which we see paralleling the first verse we read in Ezekiel chapter 9. The second is the seal or the mark of the beast. And those are the ones who are judged as we look at the second two verses that we read in the book of Ezekiel. Turn to Revelation chapter 20 for the contrast between those who have the seal of God in their foreheads and those who have taken the mark of the beast earlier back in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. In chapter 20, verse 4, it says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark, in their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years sealed by God's seal sealed by the devil's seal what a difference in destinations and we see it both in Ezekiel and in Revelation the next book in the Old Testament is the book of Daniel please turn with me to Daniel chapter 2 and verses 35, uh, 31 through 45. Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 through 45. Here we have the great vision of Nebuchadnezzar. None of the wise men of Babylon have been able to interpret it. They are about to be slain when Daniel hears the news and speaks to Arioch, who is the generals sent out to fulfill that decree of the king and kill the wise men. And Daniel and his friends pray, and Daniel, it is revealed to him what that dream is. Beginning in verse 31. Then, O king, or thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest that a stone was cut out without hands. By the way, I should pause and mention something here at this point. In the Old Testament, the stones that were set up for an altar were not to be cut because they had a very special symbolism in the person of Christ who is our rock. So here we find a, that it is a stone out of the mountain cut without hands which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the fields, and the fowl of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, 
and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and a third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh in all things, it sh shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, and there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with a miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 12. And verse 10. In the immediate preceding verses, we've seen the war in heaven. Michael and his archangels fighting with the devil and his angels, and Satan is cast out of heaven, and there is no more place there found for them. And he and his angels are cast out with him. And verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Now is come the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. We look at Revelation chapter 11. And verse 15. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms are of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Christ in the book of Daniel. Our time is about up, so let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that the kingdoms of this world, all those mighty kingdoms that thought themselves great, have been crushed, have been smitten by the rock, not hewn with hands. And there is coming the day when it will be the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ that crushes all the kingdoms of this earth. And he shall reign forever and ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Christ in all the scriptures. Our Lord Jesus Christ opened the eyes of the two on the road to Emmaus. And he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all the things that the prophets have spoken. Are not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And later, as he breaks the bread and they recognize him and he vanishes, they said, did not our hearts burn within us as we walked by the way? And he expounded unto us the scriptures. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is a composite unity from beginning to end, seamlessly woven throughout with the theme of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, with the theme of your eternal Son, the one who, as wisdom personified, as portrayed in Proverbs, is the one who is made unto us wisdom and righteousness 
and sanctification and redemption. The Christ who is the creator portrayed for us in Genesis 1 and John 1. The Christ who is the wounded savior portrayed for us in Isaiah 53 and each of the crucifixion narratives of the Gospels. Our ascended Lord, as portrayed for us in Psalm 110 and in Acts chapter 1 at the end of the Gospel of Luke. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is coming again and who will establish as promised in your word in the Old Testament his kingdom, which will crush all the kingdoms of this world. He is the Christ of Scripture, and Father, we thank you for him, for he is our Savior and our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.